yourselves this fine Wednesday evening. I'm not playing Joe Biden tonight. So I'm, I'm actually editing some of the script as we go through. But uh, yeah, we, we are, just to let you guys all know, we're, we're messing around with the Patreon thing a little bit. Uh, it was under maintenance today, so some of you may have noticed that the links were not active. There were some issues there. But essentially what's going on is we're running it off of my law firm servers. And here we've only got like three or four people. So, you know, the downloads, the usage, all that stuff doesn't really impact things very much. But with that video that we had up there, there were a bunch of downloads that just burned up a ton of bandwidth and uh, kind of gummed things up a little bit. So anyway what we're going to do on those videos because we don't seem to have a problem with the documents you know the pdf files that i think they just don't take as much bandwidth when people are looking at them or messing around with them but the videos when people are doing stuff with them it really gums things up here at the office so what we're going to do is we're going to move those things to the youtube members section but that's going to take us some time to get up and going so don't expect anything to really be happening there with the videos at least until after mid-February when I've got more time to do this stuff. Right now I'm still buried up to my butt and alligators grinding out these oppositions to these motions to dismiss. Got what four of them are due on what Tuesday, Wednesday next week. And then I've got another batch of them that are due, you know, I think by the 10th. So I'm, I'm going to just be really super, super busy for the next couple of weeks. So it's, you know, don't look for videos and stuff on Patreon at the moment. And in fact, don't look for them on Patreon at all because it just chews up too much bandwidth, kind of takes down the servers or at least slows them up a lot. So I'm just gonna sort of fix that. Um, what else did I want to tell you guys? There's something else. Oh, oh, this is my last night this week being with you. James is gonna be running the streams for thursday friday saturday and sunday i'm actually going to a trial skills intensive like boot camp workshop in las vegas uh thursday through sunday night so i won't be back in time on sunday to to do the live either i'm coming in late but i will be back monday in the meantime enjoy yourselves with james don't be you know too aggressive with him he's still a young man and subject to all the things young men are subject to but i leave you guys all to your devices with them okay tonight we're gonna do volume five part two of karen wagner and james were you working on getting karen wagner uploaded since it wasn't ready yes yeah, okay how, how how long do i have to sit here and blather before we can actually put it on Okay, so anyway, James was dealing with a lot of problems today, so he, he was unable to get uh, the Karen Wagner Volume 5 Part 2 timely uploaded for the broadcast, but he's it's working on publishing right now, so I got to you know hang out with you guys and chit-chat for a little bit. But anyway, <clears throat> tomorrow we'll do Part 3. And like I said, James will be dealing with you guys there. I don't know if he's planning on doing a recorded intro and outro and then just playing it, or if he's going to be on to chit chat as they go through it, or I don't know what his plan is, but uh, we'll figure it out. And then we're thinking what we might do on Sunday instead of a question and answer session is, and, and since we're taking down the torts, or not torts, but the how to file a tort claim thing. What we might do with that one is go ahead and live stream it on Sunday. And then going forward from that point, we'll do the how-to videos in the YouTube members only section. And we'll just see how that goes. But anyway, that's something to look forward to. I'm not sure what he has planned for Friday and Saturday. We'll get it figured out. Or maybe I can port in or something like that. And we'll, we'll get that figured out. Um, as for Patreon subscribers, there's a whole bunch of stuff up there, but like I said, you may not be able to get to the links yet. I know that we were working on some maintenance issues and getting things worked out there. I'll check with James before we're through tonight and he can let us know whether that's up. Um, oh, actually he has a note here. It says Patreon is down for the moment till further notice. 
He'll get everything up by tomorrow. Oh, tomorrow's a maybe. Tomorrow's a maybe for real. I'm take my time with it. Oh, don't make don't, sure everything's don't. working properly so it doesn't happen again. All right. Well, that's fine. Click but... the plus on your screen. Okay. Where's the plus? Bottom. Right there. Bottom. Right here. Right there. Okay. Go to local video. Local video. Here. V. V. Scroll down. Scroll down. Here. Which one? Video editor? Up top. Video editing? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Just name out the folders. Why don't you? Okay. Then go here, top. Okay. Five. Uh huh. Two. Two. Got it. No. No. Well, you said two. Well, we can do it over. Just do new. No, just delete it off this thing. I don't. Oh, don't get so so angry. It's not like a major crisis here, and everybody's watching. By the way, come on, man, keep it under control. Uh, to the mom. video. Oh, man. Yeah. yeah, but it's unnecessary. The earth, and you can that one. That one. Okay. There we go. All right, you guys. I think we've got it now. Okay. What do you mean? Kai. Like I said, you don't need to read it in detail. I'm not going to have a lot of questions about it for you. I just want you to. Uh, well, wait, I got to pause it and start over. Okay. <clears throat> All right, guys, here we go. Anyway, he's uh, struggling today. You can probably hear it in his voice, a little bit upset. He is speaking at me in Mandarin, which luckily I understand. So we're able to deal with it. Anyway, if you'd like to get caught up or explore the YouTube pages, please go ahead and do that. There's a file section, a live section, and, um, you know, get there. If you had developed questions today that we don't get answered, or, you know, if you're a returning visitor watching a recording and you develop questions, just email them to capsandstemslaw at gmail.com. We'll do what we can to answer them. Uh, Sunday Live. Obviously, though, we're not going to be answering questions at this Sunday's Live because I won't be here to do it. But, um, you know, we'll put it over. Probably we'll do that on Monday. For those of you who are not Patreon subscribers but want to check that out or become Patreon subscribers, here's the link to how to get there. And, uh, yeah, I should be able to just click on it. Just remember, for those of you who are viewing this on a replay, the chat is not recorded. It's only a live stream, so you won't be able to see it. But if you go to Patreon, do a search on us, Caps and Stems, you'll find it. Anyway, with that all said and done, Karen Wagner, Volume 5, Part 2. It's 17 minutes long. Remember, I'm not providing legal advice or counsel. We're providing educational content purely. So don't take anything that I say or do here as legal advice or legal counsel. With that said, let's go ahead and get moving. Like I said, you don't need to read it in detail. I'm not going to have a lot of questions about it for you. I just want you to be able to tell me whether or not you've seen it before. No, I have not seen this. Okay. Did you learn at any point in time? Do you know who uh, Bill Chidicamo is? No. Are you a licensed clinical social worker? No. Have you ever, do you have any professional licenses of any kind? No. I'll read something to you and see if you can interpret that for me based on your training and experience as an investigator. Here on page 329 of exhibit 39, says uh, risk of further maltreatment low. What would that mean to you as an investigator? It would mean that the, um, the likelihood that this may be repeated would be um, described as being a low risk likelihood of this being repeated, that presumes that it actually happened, right? Possibly. Okay, let me ask, ask you about this next thing. Ex explanation of risk, also on page 329. This could be a case where the reporting parties mistakenly identified this family as being the source of the shouting and yelling, when in fact the situation actually happened in the neighboring residence. What would that mean to you as an investigator? That there's 
you know, other information out there that um, possibly you know, there's another report for neighbors. Well, if it was confused with somebody else, that would be exculpatory, wouldn't it? Yes. That would exonerate the accused person, right? Me. Okay. Is that important information? Yes. Why? Because if there's somebody else has done it and they didn't do it, then then maybe they're being falsely accused, right? Could be, yes. What did you do to ensure that these parents weren't being falsely accused before getting their kids out of their care? What did you do to make sure that the accusations weren't false? Um, I read the, I got the initial report. Mm -hmm. I read that, I discussed it with the military personnel who had called it in and discussed their concerns that they had. Um, it wasn't until later that we were able to obtain all of the statements. Mm -hmm. So I'm asking parents, I'm asking children, I'm asking family, the you know, schools, the ad advocacy center. You asked somebody at school something? When you when we go to the school and we talk with the school, we usually get um, a print off of like their attendance records and um, their demographic sheet. Mm -hmm. That sounds generally though. I'm, I'm, my question is actually very specific. I'm talking about this family mm -hmm. as, as the safeguard that we talked about earlier. Your, your safeguard to ensure that they're not being falsely accused. So for this family, the Pellerin family, mm -hmm. what steps did you do to satisfy your responsibility as a safeguard to make sure they weren't being falsely accused? What did you do before I, removing the children? I con conducted my investigation. Which included what? Speaking to the source, speaking to the children, speaking to the parents, um, speaking to um, the military personnel. spoke to police. I think that's it. And you did all of that on May 10th before removing the children, correct? I don't recall the day that the children were actually removed. Okay. Whatever day it was, you did all of this. Talk to the source, talk to the children, talk to the parents, talk to the military, talk to the police the same day, correct? Pretty much, yeah. Because we, we know that you were assigned the investigation on the same day that the children were removed from their family home and transited to the grandparents' home, right? Yes. In fact, you were assigned the case sometime that morning, right? Yes. And you went out and, well, let me ask you this. The first step that you followed in that investigation, mm -hmm. what was it? I got the report, I read it. Um, we look in our system for prior incidents with the family. Mm -hmm. um, and there were none, right? As far as I recall, yes. There okay, were none. go ahead. Um, if we have the personal identifiers information, we run their background, their criminal history. Mm -hmm. And there was none for either of these parents, correct? I don't recall. Okay, go ahead. Um, then you call the source Okay. if that's... that source is available. Okay, when you say call the source, that's the reporting party? Yes. Okay. Who was that? Did, well, let me ask you this first. Do you have a specific recollection of calling the source in this case, in the Pellerin case? Yes. Okay, who'd you call? The military. Who? I don't know. The military has name. millions of members. If I saw the report and it was on there, I could tell you, but I don't recall exactly. Which report? Name. The report to the hotline. Okay, let me see if I can find that. Uh, where would that be?
Would it be the CPS report summary? Does that sound correct? I don't believe it'll have the source in there. Let me show you what it is and we'll go from there. I'm going to show you what we marked yesterday to Miss uh, Hart's deposition as exhibit number 41. You can look through that and tell me if that's the report you're talking about. Yes, this is the report. Okay, and uh, in reviewing that report, are you able to tell me uh, who it was that you spoke to as the source? I'm not. Where would that normally be listed? I believe uh, it would on, on, on the bottom of page seven is where I believe it would be. These are, this is an old computer system and I don't recall exactly. Okay. The print's different now, but it is not, you have what's here is called the police version mm -hmm. where the source information is not in here. It's been redacted. Okay. So I can't tell you who the source is. What did you do to evaluate the credibility of this so-called source, if anything? I spoke with him, and he was able to provide me the basic information. Did you record that basic information somewhere? I believe I documented the date and the time that I spoke with him. Okay, but we talked about this a little bit earlier. When we're documenting conversations, we're supposed to document the date, the time, the identity, and the substance of the conversation, correct? Mm -hmm. Yes. So did you document somewhere the substance of this conversation with the so-called source? Yes. Okay, where? I, I would have written it on the front page. On the front page of? The report. This report? Exhibit 41? Yes. Okay, can you find that for me? Well, it's not on here. This is not. This is your copy. Okay, so in addition to the identity of the source being redacted, the actual substance of the report was redacted as well? Substance? No. Okay, that's what I'm looking for is what this source told you. You understand? That's what I mean by substance, correct? Yes. Okay, where am I going to find the substance of the report? It will be in the CSRA under source box. Okay. That's what I want to know. Before we get to that, though, let's go back to my original question, which is, did you do anything to evaluate the credibility of the source? to make sure what he was telling you or she was telling you was reliable information. Did you do that? Initially, no. What do you mean when you say initially, no? Because he was telling me about some documents that 
he could discuss with me, but neither one of them had them in their um, possession. Possession. And when you say neither one of them, was there more than one source? No. What do you mean when you say neither one of them had the documents? Neither him nor I had the documents. Okay. And when was this initial phone call? Was it the same day that the children? I believe it was. I believe it was the same day that I received the report. Okay. Which was the same day the children were removed. No. Now, if we look at page, internal page three of seven of exhibit number 41, if you can look uh, for me at that first entry, uh, this one right here, mm -hmm. you see somewhere there it says uh, response date? It's towards the middle of the page top. Let me highlight it for you. It says response date. I see response yeah. time. Response date and response time. They're highlighted in yellow so they're easy to identify. You see the one there where it says response date? Remind me of the exhibit number. Number 41, page three, internal page three. See that? Yes. Okay, and what does that say the response date was? 5, 10 of 13. Okay, so that would have been May 10th, 2013, right? Yes. And the time of the response? 2.20. Okay, and what does that mean when we see response date? That is the date that you made contact with the alleged victim child. Okay, is there any way we can tell from that? And, and that's all that means is just the date you made contact with the alleged victim. Correct. Okay. That differs a little bit from what Ms. Hart told us yesterday, but that's okay. We'll go with what you've got at the moment. Um, is there any way other than that report there that we can tell when it was that you were first assigned the task of investigating this referral? Yes. How? On the other front page. What other front page? The front page that goes with this report. Oh, okay. And let me just highlight it. I'll give that to you. It's Bates Mark 202420. And assign date. And when was uh, this referral assigned to you for investigation? April 30th. Okay is, there any, okay, is there any way that we can tell from any document, whether it's this document or some other document, when it was that you made this first contact with anybody as part of your investigation? It should be documented in the CSRA. Okay that upon receiving the report that I would have attempted to call the source. Okay. And let's see here where that is. And Ms. Uh, Hart gave us this yesterday just to save time so I don't spend a lot of time rifling through my documents to find the CSRA. I'll hand you the CSRA that she gave us yesterday. At her deposition, we can mark it as Exhibit C. Okay. So you can mark that one separately as opposed to, it was A, I think, yes, sir, but I don't remember. Was it A? I, I hate to say it because if I'm wrong. Why I mean, don't we do this? Let's not mark it. We all know what it is. It's, we know what it is. Let's just not mark it. And I just, what I'm really looking for is to refresh your recollection when exactly it was that she made this contact. So we don't need to mark the exhibit for that. Okay. So take a look at that and um, let me know when it was that you made first contact with this alleged source. Yes, that was Wow, that was short. Uh, I'll just address right now before we get to the other questions. I'll just address right now Sandra Thornhill's question. She says, why is she so damn slow? She moved awfully quick to falsely remove those children and ruin lives. Watching her is beyond torturous. Yeah, I agree. 
she is slow. And you're going to see that as a continuing theme as we go through other cases and depositions of other social workers, particularly, I think Candace Nelson is up on this channel. I don't remember exactly where, but she's uh, the heavyset black lady from the Duval case. We actually cut out a bunch of her pauses because they were 30 seconds, a minute long. I actually had to take her deposition for like two and a half days because I would ask a question. So what time is it? Here, here's her response. What time is it? I don't know. And, and it was seriously like that. So I think, yes, they do it on purpose because they are aware that we have statutory time limits in federal court. You only get seven hours with these people. And if you can't get your work done in seven hours, doesn't matter. You got to go to court, make a showing of good cause to get more time. That sometimes is very difficult. They're very aware of that. So, you know, they will delay and hang up and use every trick in the book to burn up your transcript time. Luckily, when you're doing one of these depositions and you're looking at that seven hour limitation, it's seven hours on record. So it is actually transcript time. So every time that the attorney wants to talk about something or there's there's something that, you know, you need to clarify or somebody, you know, wants to do something other than answer questions on the record. It's a good idea to take a break. Say, hey, look, let's go off the record. We'll do whatever it is you want to do or deal with whatever it is you want to deal with. But let's do it off the record. And then you go off the record, maybe you're five, 10 minutes, 15 minutes, whatever. Come back on, do your work. But several of those breaks that that adds up a lot of time. So, you know, four breaks would be an hour if it took 15 minutes. So just be aware of that and, you know, don't do too much fighting and bullshit on the record if you really don't have to. <clears throat> uh, let's see what else we have here. We have a question from me. It says, can you give an example of a question that is argumentative? versus the same question that's not argumentative. In the context of a cross-examination of an adverse witness, and remember Karen Wagner is an adverse witness. In fact, most of the depositions we're going to be playing here are adverse witnesses. Even Matthew Miller, at the time we deposed him, was an adverse witness. So full-blown argumentative cross still would have you know, been appropriate. But typically, an argumentative question is not going to be permitted on direct examination, right? That's where you're talking to neutral people or your own people. But lead, leading and argumentative questions frequently are, and, and basically an argumentative question is very similar to a leading question in the sense that it presumes or assumes the answer in the quest, in the body of the question itself. Now, one that would be impermissible would be one where you pose a question and no matter what the answer is, it, it's bad. Like for exa a perfect example, and you'll you'll hear this probably in law school if you if you take you know a formal class. When did you quit beating your wife? Number one, it assumes that you beat your wife, and no matter what your answer is, it's like, well, I don't beat my wife. I didn't, you know, I, yesterday, you know, it's it's that's an argument of the question that a judge would probably sustain the 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 objection on, even though you're framing it or posing it to an adverse witness. So the way that you would ask that, I guess, in a non-argument way, uh, argumentative way, would just be change it to a do you, or have you ever, have you ever beaten your wife? No. Right. So it's, it's sort of more open-ended or describe to me your relationship with your wife is, you know, is it verbal? Is it physical? Do you, have you ever beaten her? You know, something like that. But I think that more or less responds to your question. Yeah, she is dense. Not, not miss of this crazy Wagner lady. Um, no, actually Lawrence, those questions about, um, you know, you signed this under penalty of perjury or, you know, weren't you trained what perjury means? That sort of thing. Those aren't really argumentative. Now, I've had objections at trial sustained based on argumentative tone. Like maybe I got frustrated with a witness 
they're dicking around with the answer. And I say, are you serious? You've never heard that blah, 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 blah. And argument, objection, argument of tone just says, yeah, sustain. Mr. McMillan, do you need a break? <laughs> it's like, oh, my God. So that happens sometimes. You know, you, you got to try to keep your emotions in check. Um, C. Roberts, what kind of attorney takes appointments from the Supreme Court? A dragon slayer or ass kicker? The Supreme Court. So that's probably going to be a situation where there's a pro per with a cognizable claim that the Supreme Court thinks, you know, justifies some attorney attention and briefing. A good example of that actually would be Bivens versus six unknown named agents. I actually knew Bivens. He uh, moved out here from New York. My brother brought, brought him out uh, after he found him in a in a shelter out there. But Webster Bivens, he had gotten rolled up on some federal charges and he wrote his own civil claim, civil lawsuit against the DEA agents, federal DEA agents that rolled him up and convicted him. And he, he wrote his writ, got out, then sued him, also in pro per, and got dismissed in the federal district court. They said, oh, wait, you know, 1983 doesn't apply to federal agents. It's only applicable to, you know, state municipal government agents. So, no, you're asked out. He took it to the whatever second district, whatever, or second circuit, whatever New York is. I don't remember what circuit they are. The Court of Appeal affirmed the dismissal and said, no, no, there's no such thing as a 1983 claim against federal agents. So he hand wrote his petition for certiorari. The Supreme Court ordered, you know, briefing from the state and they or the, from the feds, from the DEA, and they briefed it. And then the Supreme Court appointed Webster, a Supreme Court attorney to go ahead and prosecute the appeal, and they accepted it. They accepted the petition for writ of certiorari. So then it was fully briefed, and if you look it up, that is where the federal or the civil claim, the corollary to 42 U.S.C. Section 1983, but against federal officers, was created. It was Bivens versus six unknown named agents. So it's worth a read. It's part of history. And, you know, at the connection, I actually personally knew the guy and he, he knew my kids. He used to cook every Friday. He'd cook us this big chicken dinner and he'd bring it by the warehouse. We'd eat dinner. And he was a really cool cat. He died a few years ago of prostate cancer, but he was old. He died at like 92. And, um, you know, he's always hit me up uh, to get him Viagra from India because even at 92, he is still a, a pretty energetic old guy. But he's a cool cat. Anyway, read his case. Bivens versus six unknown named agents is a U.S. Supreme Court case. Interesting story there, and it's generally a pretty good read. Um, let's see. Bup, bup, bup. So anyway, I think that answers your question. It, it can be a dragon slayer or it can be an ass kisser. You know, it just it's luck of the draw. Uh, Dr. Sophie is still one of my favorite. Yeah, I got to find him. I want to put the whole video up because I think what's floating around out there on the net is just the excerpts that we played at trial in Duval. His whole video was two sessions. I don't remember, three or four hours each. And there's there's some gnarly, gnarly stuff on there. I caught him. His attorneys had put together a false declaration. and He just didn't really read it, just kind of signed it. And I caught him on that in the first volume of the video. I said, dude, look, I'm going to give you a chance to fix this. So we're going to suspend. You go back, you do your work, come back, and let's try this again and see if we can fix things. So anyway, that'll be an interesting one if I can find the whole video. <clears throat> Adverse witness is a very diplomatic way to describe this POS. Yeah, I agree. Okay, John Eifer, I know he's no longer there, but can Bobby Cagle be deposed if it was necessary? Probably if, if Bobby Cagle played a direct role in the case, then yeah, but otherwise probably not. Is this the first time you've been pregnant? Oh, yeah, that, that could be. Well, no, is this the first time you've been pregnant? I don't think that would be argumentative. I mean, that's a legit question. You could say, no, not first. 
<clears throat> uh, John Eifer, if, if Bobby Cagle personally signed the document, potentially, then you'd go after him as a complaining witness. But if his name just appears on a document, you know, printed name, then uh, it's not the same as, as reviewing it, approving it, signing it, and, um, you know, ratifying it. Mighty Mindy, yeah, that freaking guy was flirting with me right on the record. It was gross. Give me the heebie-jeebies. But anyway, yeah, you can see it. If I can find the video, you can see that shit going down. It's crazy. Um, yeah, Nessa Bivens was pro per all the way. Well, until the Supreme Court. Um, I don't know, Missa, is it strategic to handwrite the Supreme Court brief as a pro per? I don't know that it necessarily is advantageous. The problem was he was in prison on a conspiracy charge while he was writing it, and he didn't have access to a computer, and so he just hand wrote the thing. And his, his I mean, I've seen the brief. It, it's totally legible. He actually had very good penmanship. And, um, and it was very well put together. In fact, w while he was in prison, he became somewhat of a jailhouse lawyer. He got a bunch of people out of prison writing on writs of habeas corpus, you know, in the law library while he was serving his time. So he's a really interesting guy. Um, Imani Violette. Yes, Patreon is... Patreon is down at the moment. James is working on getting that thing figured out and back up and running. What was going on? There were just a bunch of downloads of the filing a tort claim video, and it kind of gummed things up and got things a little screwy. So we're, we're working on getting that corrected. But yeah, it is down at the moment. It will be back up, if not later tonight, then tomorrow. Um. Let's see here. Let me go to let me go to the caps and stems stuff. It looks like we have quite a few questions here tonight. First one is from Sylvia Ann Auswiger. It says ways to get the quote reporting party quote redacted name of who called in an allegation of the child welfare hotline. The way you're going to get that is in your civil litigation in federal court. Uh, you're just going to ask for it and then move to compel it when they don't want to give it. The law in California is that the reporting party information is confident, is presumptively confidential by statute, but it's a rebuttable presumption. So, for example, we, we frequently get reporting party information, you know, mainly, especially in cases where it's a, you know, it's a judicial deception case and they're, they're a material witness to a deception you know, then, you know, you're going to have a, a good basis to get over the confidentiality. The judge will impose a protective order, maybe even an attorney's eyes only protective order. And um, you'll get that information. Now, I could see a problem in a pro per case with an attorney eyes only protective order because you don't have an attorney. And the whole point of the attorney's eyes only protective order is to prevent the party who may know the person and may have motivation to go out, injure her, whatever, harass the person from getting the information. So where you're pro per, it might be difficult. I'm not really sure. I haven't faced that. Next question is uh, Jennifer Hebert or Herbert. I think it's Hebert. She, I saw her on earlier today in the, or tonight in the chat. I think she cut out early for dinner or something. Anyway, it says two case specific will not answer. She says, I felt like an ass after I wrote that, so I pasted the questions anyway. Oh, shit. I, I just pulled a major Biden moment. I was, uh, this is James's comment to me. Um, all right, well, <laughs> let me look at it, and we'll see if we can answer. I have my two young daughters unjustly illegally removed from my custody and care three times now, starting when my firstborn daughter was four days old. I'm almost certain that Los Angeles DCFS didn't have a warrant the first time, the third time, and possibly the second time as well. I was also in the Ninth Circuit with major civil rights federal lawsuit against LA DCFS for unjustly taking my children away from me the first two times. Yet a third time, which my former attorney and I felt was retaliation for suing them. 
I began my new civil rights lawsuit against them. Would it be a warrantless seizure lawsuit or retaliation lawsuit? Or could, or could the two be combined to make it an even stronger lawsuit? Wow, yeah, that's very case specific. I would direct you to a Ninth Circuit case called CAP versus City of San Diego, C-A-P-P v. City of San Diego, or County of San Diego, I'm sorry. CAP versus County of San Diego. Pull that case, look at it. That'll lay out the elements of a retaliation claim under 42 U.S.C. Section 1983. For the warrantless seizure claim, there's a whole bunch of cases out there. And, uh, you know, Mame, Wallace, what else, Swartwood, I mean, all the Rogers, you know, those are all good cases to look at. But that's as much advice as I can give you here is go read those cases and then make your own decision, you know, what claims your facts would fit. <clears throat> Okay, uh, next question from her is, lastly, would I be able to sue DCFS one time for all three illegal removals of my daughter? Would there be more than one lawsuit? I don't really know. Based on the fact that you've already sued them once and lost in the trial court, you're up in front of the Ninth Circuit, I would say that they have a really good collateral estoppel argument or res judicata, the collateral estoppel or res judicata argument against any further litigation at least to the extent it was covered in your prior lawsuit. But, you know, talk to your attorney about that. It sounds like you already have one. Um, you know, I, I don't really know what else to tell you on that. All right, I'm going to go back to the chat and see if we can't finish this out. <clears throat> um, C. Roberts, if cops conduct a SCAR... Find no safety issues. County Council says no issues. How did CSW? <clears throat> how did CSW get a no bail warrant? Probably uh, went and lied in their court report that happened with or their warrant application. That happens all the time. So what you want to do is get a copy of the warrant affidavit, the application, and see what they said there. Is it true? Is it demonstrably untrue? Did they know it was untrue? So that's you know kind of what you uh, want to look at. Mighty Mindy, <clears throat> Richard Fine, do you know him, Sean? I know of Richard Fine. I think he's like a maybe a disbarred attorney or so. I, I don't know exactly. I recognize the name. I don't know, you know, exactly what his issue is or what his you know claim to fame is. <clears throat> Isn't it better to have them just tell the truth instead of having to drag it out of them? This is from Lawrence Espinosa. Yeah, I mean, yeah then we could finish their depot in like 15 minutes. Here's a court report. Point out everywhere where you lied. Absolutely. They're never going to do that. These, these people, they make you earn every penny. And, um, you know, that's just the way it is, which is fine because, frankly, I, I enjoy doing depositions. I, I don't know if you can tell or not, you know, when I'm doing these things, but it's, it's, I've got this kind of sadistic side to me. And the more painful it looks, the more I like to dig and poke and prod and annoy and harass and all that stuff. And yeah, I kind of dig it. So, you know, more power to them. If they, if they want to, you know, make me pull it out like pulling teeth, I'll pull every last freaking tooth. It's fun. I like it. But yeah, it would be easier. Uh, let's see what else we got here. Bear with me one moment. Remember to try to use a lot of question marks or big red ones if you have that available. Um, you fail me. Why does a case, oops, where'd that go? Why does a case without a warrant not shut DCFS down? Because not enough people sue. I mean, that's, that's just basically the bottom line. Not enough people sue. So they keep doing it. And they sort of look at it as a cost of doing business. If they get a thousand kids into the system and one or two people sue and it costs them, you know, a few hundred thousand dollars each. Think about how much money they got in for the thousand people who did not sue. Right. It's, it's basically a risk or cost benefit analysis they go through. So that's why not. <clears throat> yeah. I uh, see Roberts. Yeah. I thought I knew him from, I think I read an article about him in the law journal or something. But yeah, that's that was my memory. I thought he get got disbarred. Do warrants need a signature? Well, they don't need a blue ink signature. You know, the judge can do an electronic signature. They can do a rubber stamp. They can do, you know, whatever. But they do need to be reviewed by a judge and signed. So yeah. 
Lawrence, you like cornering the wounded rat. Well, they're not, you don't always know immediately whether or not they're wounded. So you have to actually corner them, wound them, maybe wound them a little more, and then maybe wound them a little more, and then maybe bleed them a little bit, and then maybe leave them for you know, several months and let them heal up a little bit and then bring them back and wound them again. And, you know, that sort of thing. It's like, like I said earlier, it's like pulling wings off of flies if you're into that. But anyway, let's see what else. Think Misa, Misa, do you prefer depoing and trial work over brief writing? You know, I enjoy brief writing too. It's like putting together a puzzle or deconstructing somebody's bullshit argument and addressing it, but it's a lot more, it's a lot more cognitively demanding. That's probably the best way to put it. Like on these briefs, I've been grinding and grinding on grinding for days. I'm finally starting to make progress and it feels pretty good. I can see light at the end of the tunnel. But man, it's a it's a laborious task. You got to research. You got to deconstruct and de de compile their arguments. See where they're wrong. They miscite cases. They come up with shit that's not in the complaint. It's just, I guess, in a sense, it's the same kind of crap you're dealing with when you do a depot. But you know, with a depot, I can shuck and jive a little bit more. I'm briefing. I'm just sitting here reading and writing. It's I don't know. I don't know. I, I don't. I don't know how to answer that question. Bail <clears throat> uh, right. Can a plea be made by nunc pro tump? I don't know about a plea. I don't do criminal work, and you know, I don't. I don't know. C. Roberts. I don't know what the answer to that question is. Um, does a warrant appear before a judge? And the warrant at Mighty Mindy, does a warrant appear before a judge under penalty of perjury? What you really mean to ask, does a warrant application appear before a judge signed under penalty of perjury? Yeah, absolutely. That's why you can sue whoever prepared the warrant application and signed it under penalty of perjury. You can sue them if it's knowingly false, right? Or knowingly suppresses material exculpatory information. It's because it's signed under penalty of perjury and the judge is relying on it, you know, to be true. <clears throat> yeah, hate love relationship. That's probably a good way to describe it. Do you ever have aha moments where something new is revealed that swings the case either way? Yeah, sometimes, sometimes, but rarely are the aha moments, you know, in their favor. It's usually the social worker saying something, thinking they're being clever saying something or, or obstructionist and I can't get to them, saying something stupid and then I sit there and go, oh my God, did they really just say that? I need to go amend my complaint. Holy crap. Um, so yeah, that does happen. In fact, the ES case, when we just settled, that happened. They, the whole thing came up about the uh, medical examinations, unwarranted medical examinations. I had no idea. I was like, hey, what's this? Oh yeah, we do that all the time. I was like, what? So yeah, we amended the complaint and off to the races. Uh, same thing with NL. That came up in a deposition. I had no clue, no idea. And the guy just comes out and says, oh, yeah, you don't wink. That's what we do. It's like, holy crap. So, yeah. And that ended up, uh, you know, it was 50 grand on Children's Hospital LA for the kid and then 780 or so in attorney's fees on that. So, yeah, sometimes um, they say stupid things that get them popped. That does happen. <clears throat> um what was the next question? You fail me. Is If there's no warrant in a case, is there still a case? Well, yeah, then it would be a warrantless seizure case. Remember, 4th and 14th Amendment, they can't take a kid without a warrant, unless at the time of the taking, they have specific articulable facts to show that there's kids in immediate danger of suffering severe bodily injury or death. Yes. I'm getting the dinner signal. So, yeah, those are all about warrantless taking. So if there's no warrant, yeah, there could still be a, a case. Um, yeah, Mighty Mindy, I would agree with you. Those, those sex exams or sex abuse exams, they, they are pretty intrusive and pretty substantial. Anyway, with that, I am getting the signal here that in the interest of domestic tranquility, I am required to end this for tonight and go eat dinner. They're all waiting for me. So anyway, 
you have any questions, thank you everyone for attending tonight's stream. Really appreciate it. We'll, we're working on getting Patreon back up and running either tonight or you know tomorrow morning. It will be there. Tomorrow we're going to stream Volume 5 Part 3. I won't be doing that. I'm not sure what James has in mind for that. Hopefully he can be here with you guys. I'll, I'll talk to him about it. Um, as a reminder, Volumes 1 through 3 combined are up on YouTube for your viewing pleasure. Remember, yet, if you do have questions, email them to capsandstemslaw at gmail.com. We will respond to those as time permits. Patreon subscribers, uh, you know, just let us know and your questions get priority. So you're at the top of the list. Uh, if you get them in on, again, get them in. But uh, we'll address those. I, I try to address them also in writing on, you know, the post on Patreon, just so you have something in writing. But I don't always get that done. If, especially if I've addressed it already in the live. So, um, but I'll try to do that just so you have your own. So anyway, guys, I'm off to dinner. Thank you very much for attending. Have a wonderful, wonderful evening. Remember, please support, show James your love. He's sort of under a lot of stress right now. Like, comment, share, subscribe, share it with your friends, put it out on TikTok, whatever you can do you know, to let people know what we're doing here and maybe they'll get some benefit. Thank you everyone for attending tonight. Have a wonderful evening. I have very much enjoyed tonight's live chat. That was uh, pretty fun. <laughs>